Okay guys, so welcome. Today I'm going to talk about using heart rate in your training and the purpose of today is to give you an insight into what I know about heart rate training, how I've used it throughout my career. Less today about how to identify your heart rate zones. We'll talk a little bit about that and I'll give you a little test of what you could do to perhaps get an idea of where those heart rate zones sit. But I really wanna discuss knowing how to use heart rate, knowing what sort of things will fluctuate your heart rate. I know when to push, when not to push, and I have a fair idea without using a lactometer, anything like that, where the effort level would be. I've raced 10 to 15 marathons. I have all the data of every single marathon, um, where my heart rate was at mile eight, where my heart rate was at mile 14, how I was then able to either sustain that heart rate or perhaps it started to drop towards the end and why. Did temperature affect that? Did my fueling affect that, etc. And so that's what we're looking to identify today is to give you a better understanding if you're going to use heart rate in your training and you want to get better at running, you should start using heart rate in your training. But if you do decide to start using heart rate in training, how would you go about doing that? If you already use heart rate in training, but you're kind of unsure, you know, what it means, how to use it, how to dissect it, how to analyze it, should you analyze it? You'll learn a little thing about that. And if you've decided that you want to get a bit more technical with your heart rate and perhaps do some testing and follow-up testing to see if you've improved, well, we'll talk about that too. And so the very first thing, I'm going to probably end up shifting a lot here. My, my ass is cold. Um, so the very first thing that I'm going to talk about heart rate is the strap. So I own probably three heart rate straps. I've tried every single, not every single, probably every single, I've probably tried every single means to check heart rate as you can possibly think of, which includes the optical sensor from Polar that goes around your bicep. Um, I've tried Whoop, I've tried Aura Ring, I've tried the Garmin strap, I've tried the Polar H10 strap, all, all sorts of polar straps, to be honest. Um, straps are, in my opinion, what I find to be the most accurate, the most easy to just sort of get set up, fired on, um, and very reliable. Um, know your heart rate strap. So we have found that the Polar strap and the Garmin strap, while very reliable, there can be a little difference in beats. And so why I say that is because if I go do lab testing, for example, and I wear the Polar strap, and that's the lab physiologist strap, and then I go train and I wear my Garmin strap, if there's a little bit of a discrepancy, and reliable in terms of will give you the same results every time if you're running at sort of like same efforts and, and predictable. But they might be out by two to three beats, for example. So the Polar strap in the lab might have been giving me two to three beats higher or two to three beats lower. But I'm talking about like minimal, but at the same time, that's important. So wear the same strap. If you're using wrist heart rate, stop doing that. Seriously, stop doing that. Um, do not let a wrist heart rate dictate effort or basically give you insight into whether you had a good day or a bad day. That's a big one because you can get back from a run, you can think your heart rate was high and you're relying on this wrist strap. It, it bounces about way too much. It is all over the place. I'll wear a chest strap during the session and then sometimes I'll take it off just because I'll want to get rid of it and I'll be doing the warm down and I'll know my heart rate's about 120, 130. It's saying like 170. And am I supposed to be like upset by that? Don't let that bother you. And the optical sensors for the bicep, they're better than the wrist, but they're still not great. Still find they were a little bit unreliable. I do think Polar brought out a new one, which is supposed to be better. The only reason I would ever wear it on my bicep, females, I think from 
observation um, previous you know partners um, and just runners in the group I think the chest strap can upset not your boobs just your like the way it sits and the way it rubs on is it sports bra on the sports bra on the sports bra it can rub so I'd appreciate that you might want to try the 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 bicep sort of sensor better than the wrist but try to think of something that could pre like oh, I've seen scars and all sorts because of how it rubs with the um, sports bra so be careful with a sports bra um, but I'm sure you could put something to support it a bit just don't cover the sensors but I would get like I would get like foam honest to god I would get little bits of foam and I would put them on the strap just don't cover the sensors and and that might work I would try it um, chest strap wins all day long very reliable, very accurate. Keep an eye on your batteries. If you're going to a marathon, change your batteries. I've had that problem literally in the Olympic Games. Humble brag, I know, sorry. Running the Olympic Games, my chest strap is not working. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is great. I'm in the lead group and my heart rate's only like 155. And then, <laughs> yeah, it kind of catches up and maybe it starts working and it's like 175 and I'm like, uh-oh, um, yeah, don't do that. So I ended up taking it off and throwing it. Um, yeah, don't do that either, they're expensive. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, here's why I started using heart rate probably as like a 17 year old, 18 year old probably 16, when I first got the lactate threshold testing done, which I did lots of videos on and I won't go into today. But when I first did that test, you're given zones and it's worth, if you're gonna go pay for the test, it's worth getting the chest strap and then you start using the chest strap. And so you start using heart rate a bit more. And um, why I find it great is because I'm like a, I'm a nerd. I, I read a lot. I read a lot of like papers on heart rate training. I, I read a lot of, um, like message board forums where maybe people talk about it and I'm just a bit of a data and like not a sciencey nerd but like very into my physiology and things like this and so I find that if ever I was going to use data or interpret data it needed to be reliable and I also started really enjoying the process of while I was training and noticing if like heart rate would come down or go up depending on what training I was doing why I say down and up is because I wanted to, I wanted my heart rate to come down on runs and that was brilliant, but I still wanted the capability of pushing the heart rate up. And that's something that you might not have thought about. And so when I'm in really great shape and I'm fit and I've done the right training, then I can push that heart rate up and sustain higher heart rates for longer. Because think about it, like, you don't need the heart rate to be low. It, it's cool It's cool when you're tracking a measure and it's cool that you see it come down. So you do a six mile run on a Monday, you do it at seven minute mile pace, you do it every Monday, you do the same loop and you notice it come down. That's great, right? But that's only great if you can still push it up. It's, it kind of sucks if you can't still push it up because that's the thing with heart rate. It's only, it's only useful if you can still, and I'm not saying still get a really high max, I'm just saying that if you do that run and it's lower than it was last Monday, let's say it's five beats lower, and you're on the run and you're feeling good and it's five beats lower and you're like, yes, because you know that if you wanted to, you could have ran at 150 instead of 145. When it's a problem is when it's 140 and you're kind of thinking, shit, well, it is lower than last week, but I'm tired. I can't push. I, even if I wanted to, I couldn't bring it up five beats more. Then it's not a good thing. And so heart rate being lower isn't always a good thing. If you can't get the heart rate up, we're going to talk about that in a second. It's likely linked to nutrition or it's linked to overtraining, but we'll get there. But having a low heart rate isn't always a good thing unless you can still push it up to where you've been capable of previously. And that likely means that your training has shifted a bit, your fitness has shifted a bit. And so now the cost and the energy demand of running speeds that once upon a time were harder, so the heart rate was higher, well, now it's a bit lower and, and things have moved forward. And so I loved heart rate training. Um, I loved being able to, 
I would find a run very boring if I couldn't check in with heart rate and, and pace, especially if it's like a steadier day or a thresholdy day or a tempo day or an interval day. I like to be able to see what's going on with the heart rate. When I start to add in some VO2 training, some interval training, some hard hills, then I find it much easier to push the heart rate to higher values. And so keep an eye on your range in terms of, I literally ran a half marathon and I think I averaged 178 heart rate. I'd be lucky to get to 178 heart rate at this moment in time. And why that is, is because it's like, it's like a lack of training to then be able to utilize oxygen and, and push that bit harder to get the heart rate to go up. And, and that takes time and practice. And, and so now that I've added in, and if you watch some of the videos, I did like that aerobic power session. And I think the heart rate went up to about 176, 177, but I'm kind of working. So it's hard to believe then that I averaged 178 in a half marathon and it felt cushy. But by the time I had raced that half marathon, I had probably done 15 of those aerobic power sessions. And that pushes it up and it gives you that ability to push harder. And so it's worth tracking if you have something like Training Peaks or Strava. I know that Training Peaks does like a, you've hit a new five minute, you know, not, yeah, like max heart rate for five minutes. It's worth tracking things like that. I also think it's really worth when you get to the end of a week's training and the end of one month's training, I think it's worth tracking what was your average heart rate for that month assuming that you wore the chest strap the whole time. Because when I talk about going to altitude training, I think one of the benefits is that your heart rate's probably five to 10 beats higher just running because you're going up and down hills and it's hard work. So I think over a month of training, you've literally probably averaged five to 10 beats higher. That's great for the fitness. You've, you've worked harder. You've, you've made the body work harder for a full month of training. So most people do a full month of training. They maybe run the same miles, 60 miles. But if you were to get to the end of that month and have a look at your average heart rate for that entire month, if it's 10 beats lower than the month previous, or it's 10 beats lower than perhaps when you ran a marathon PB, and what I mean by that is in a three month buildup for a marathon, you know, you've, you've averaged, let's say 145 for a full month. And that's all sorts of training, interval training, threshold training, marathon sessions, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then in this buildup, you've done the same mileage, but your heart rate's 10 beats lower for that entire month. It's probably telling you that you didn't work as hard that month. I think that's cool to look at. I think it's cool to look at recently in training, what's your like 10 minute max for heart rate, what's your 20 minute max, your 30 minute max, your 60 minute max, your two hour max. And then you're getting an insight into how am I training? Am I capable of still handling those higher heart rates like I used to be able to? Some of that's like mental side of things, like as you learn to push yourself a bit harder, you'll be able to push that heart rate up a bit higher. And then some of it's fitness totally comes down to fitness and, you, and that takes a bit of time to build. It's gonna take me a bit of time to build that, but in a couple of weeks, you'll see that I'll do a session and I'll likely be able to push that heart rate up to 180, 180 plus and be like, wow, can't believe two, three weeks ago, I was struggling to get it up over 170, for example. So that's why I sort of loved heart rate training because I like the, the data, I like the tracking. It brought this like different element to running I also love going for a run with literally just the time X and I don't pay attention too much to it. If I'm doing a run, I'll check in with the heart rate, mainly because I like to do a lot of runs to time. So let's say like 60 minutes and I might say, don't let the heart rate go above 135. Let's keep today really easy, really slow. And then it just takes pressure off speed or anything like that. It's just a nice and easy run. Okay. Let's get into some of the things that might affect heart rate, might upset you when you're out there training, but shouldn't upset you because you, you haven't done anything wrong. Okay, so some of the things that might affect heart rate and when you're out there training, if you're malnourished, so if you haven't been eating well or you've been stressed and so appetite's been down, it can be difficult to push the heart rate up because of that malnourishment. And so if you're ever trying to do like a tempo run or intervals and you have been training well and you have been doing your regular training and so it's not fitness because you know that a week before it wasn't a problem, 
then it's likely malnourishment, nutrition. And so if you don't have enough food and fuel in the body, you'll be running along, you'll be at 160 heart rate, for example, one, maybe 165 is your kind of like tempo -y or your threshold day. And all of a sudden at 160, even though you're running fast, it's not a good sign because you know that you're overworking. And so some people might confuse that with, well, the heart rate's low and I'm running really fast. But it's only good if, you're, if you feel in control like perhaps you've done previously. And I don't mean in control with the speed. I mean, does the effort just feel like it normally does for that kind of effort? And if it doesn't, it's probably malnourishment. And I know those days because I'm out there, I'm maybe doing a two mile tempo, and I'm trying to push that heart rate up and I can't, and I'm having to run pretty fast. And if you were to check my lactate, it would be really high. And that means that I'm just working hard but yeah, that heart rate hasn't came up, it's not matching the effort, and so I'm overworking. Look out for that. That can be the same with dehydration. It can be the same with overtraining. If you're overtraining and you're starting to get fatigued, you'll really start to struggle to get that heart rate up, and that's a problem. So that's when you have to back off a little bit, eat really well, sleep really well, get your hydration under control, and hopefully, the next sort of session or two will go that little bit better, but don't force it. That's a day where you just have to back off. You actually might have to skip that day because malnourishment, overtraining or stress and fatigue in that way can just be detrimental. It might, it'll end up holding you back more than you know, you'd like. And so there is more tips, like if it is stress or it is nutrition, um, probably good opportunity to say, you know, go to joggingroom.com if this is the first time you're listening to some of my tips videos. Um, I built this running masterclass, 60 lectures, 12 hours of tips, heaps on nutrition, before training, post training, um, how to get on top of your s sort of sleep, um, and yeah, stress management, managing training, stress in training, psychological tips, you can go check it out. So the next thing that I'm going to say affects heart rate is temperature. And if you haven't noticed me shivering yet, um, it's really cold in Flagstaff. And if I'm shifting my bum, it's because the stones that I'm sitting on are, yeah, they're pretty chilly. Um, and so temperature will affect heart rate. And so if it's cold, it's very difficult to get the heart rate up. And so when this is really important to consider is in training when you're trying to hit thresholds, bring that heart rate down by about four to five beats if it's cold, as in if threshold and tempo is normally 165, shoot for 160. I'm not kidding you, it has that big an impact. If you're in a race, if it's cold and I race a marathon, I might average five to six beats lower than what I would do if it was normal temperatures. We'll get to hot. So if it's cold, I know that I need to set off at a much lower heart rate than normal and be really careful with that because your body is smart and so it's, it's, it's conserving the heart rate, but I don't know, I think when the temperature's warmer, your body, the heart rate is working harder just to regulate temperature. And so naturally when it's colder, it's not having to do that. I don't know. I think that's kind of why, but I just can tell you right now for a fact that when it's colder, allow at least three to four beats, if not five, and that'll keep the effort right. But be really wary of that because you're going to go to a marathon, a half marathon or a 10K, and if you use heart rate or you've used it in training and suddenly it's really cold where you're racing the marathon, you could make a right mess of the race trying to get to those heart rates that you've perhaps averaged in a previous marathon or half marathon or 10K or training. So be careful with that. If it's warm, it, it's higher. So if baseline is 165, well then if it's warm, I can often average two to three beats higher, but I find the effort to be the same. Like London Marathon when it was warm, I think it was 2018, and I think I averaged about 173, 174 for a marathon. And I could tell by, normally I run the first half marathon, I try to keep it below like 162, 163. Then usually by mile 18, it's up to sort of like 166, 166, 168. 
and then in the latter miles with like four or five miles to go if I'm having a really good day it'll be up over 170 and I'll be racing it might even be 172 173 I think even in Dublin it was up to like 176 and I was racing hard um, but I'm really patient with that and I set rules I set rules that by this mile it can't be above this by this mile it can't be above this no matter what that day at London I think by mile 10 it was already like 168 170 oh I was panicking but I was able to keep going and, I, and I've learned over time that that was weather weather was having a big impact on that but still be careful still tread carefully but just know that if you're out there training and it's pretty warm it's pretty hot especially if it's humid the heart rate might be up just because of that, I, I, I'm going to move inside because it's it's cold. My bum's cold. <laughs> okay, so hopefully this works for the rest of the video. It was getting very cold outside, and yeah, so temperature big impact on heart rate. Keep an eye on that. Be really careful at marathons. I would. The next thing I'm going to say because I just talked about marathons and I just talked about using rules per sort of like eight miles or 10 miles or whatever it is. It can be the same in a 10K. Um, the heart rate can take probably 10 minutes to 15 minutes to get up to heart rate is what I would say. That's how I'd explain it. Um, and it's called the bore shift. And if you wanna look that up, you can look it up and it just takes, so if around, eight minutes or 10 minutes into the race, your heart rate is 160, right? And you keep the exact same effort or training, for example, and, and you can practice this on runs and check this out on runs. But if you're out there training or if you're in a race and you know, around about 10 to 15 minutes into the race, your heart rate's 160 and you keep running on the flat ground and the weather stays the exact same and the speed stays the exact same, you will notice over the next sort of like 10 minutes to 15 minutes that the heart rate will just gradually rise. And that's what's called the bore shift. And so because of this, you have to pre-plan for that rise. And I would guess that as you're fitter, well, it might not rise as much, but it'll still go up five to seven beats. I would guess if you're two things, that five to seven beats is what's known as the bore shift. It just happens. If you keep the effort the same, if you keep the speed the same, the heart rate will gradually rise. It doesn't mean anything. It just means that if you're doing a tempo run, for example, well, when I do tempo runs, for example, and I'm trying to keep the heart rate under 162, for example, because I know that 162 is, you know, low end of threshold, I cannot in the first five minutes, if it's going to be a 30 to 40 minute threshold run, I can't already be at 162 because I know that it's going to go up in that sort of next whatever, 10 to 15, 20 minutes. I know that it's going to end up going up five to seven beats, which means that 162 is probably actually 168, 169, and that's high end of threshold. And so you have to like, the tips that I'm giving you there would be that you have to preempt that this is going to happen. You have to already prepare that you know that's going to happen. And because that's going to happen, you've set off at a heart rate at least five to 10 beats lower than where you want it to be, perhaps let's say around 20 to 30 minutes into the run or into the race. Give the heart rate time to get up to where you want it to be and don't think because it's sitting at 160, mile one, mile two, yes, I'm nailing this. And so I know that I can average about 168 for the marathon, but I also know that if I try to get 168, assuming the weather's fine and all the rest of it, if I push too soon up to 168, well then I know within five or six miles it's gonna be 170 odds, and that's too high. With heart rate, I've always found that the, the, slower, the slower you bring that heart rate up, the longer you can normally then end up sustaining it for. So if you're patient with that, gradually bringing the heart rate up, and that really tells you the importance of in a race or even in training, starting that little bit slower, giving your body, the muscles, the heart, giving it a chance 
If you give it a chance and you bring that heart rate up gradually, you can usually sustain the effort for a lot longer. And if we got into physiology, then it would be oxygen debt, lactate, not bringing the lactate too high, not sort of like, because of oxygen debt, so oxygen debt is, your heart rate can suddenly go from 110, 120 to 160. But if you, if you put the effort and you put the speed and you put the energy demand to 160, because the heart rate might be like 130, because it can't get there quick enough, you create this debt. And that debt is repaid by fatigue and lactate and waste and tiredness. Um, so don't do that. Do I know anything else for today of relevance for heart rate? Take your time getting it up there, you'll be able to sustain it for longer. Okay, if I was gonna to say to do some kind of testing with heart rate, I would say buy a strap, start using it, train the way you have been training, start to find some patterns when you're doing intervals, where does it go to? When you're doing an easy day, what does it sit at? Is it drifting? Is it going up? Is it, you know, what's it doing? Is it drifting five to 10 beats? Is it drifting 20 beats in a couple of weeks time? Is it more stable? Start to keep an eye on it. If you're an athlete that has already used heart rate for a period of time, well, the test that I would suggest is the test that I do. You know, I, I literally upload it to YouTube and I go to the track and I do five or six times 2K and I run, I start at a very, I probably start at a pace that I would call steady. It's probably a pace that if I was going to, let me change that. Start at the track, go to the track and do your five times 2K. If you know your marathon pace, well, start a good bit slower than that. Maybe like 30 seconds to 60 seconds per mile slower than marathon pace. And do either one mile or 2K at that pace. A mile is plenty. At the end of the mile, you write down a few stats or you can get them later when you're back to the house. But you finish a mile, try to do it at a very even pace. So every 400 meters, you're checking in with the pace. And that means that you're not throwing the heart rate around way too much or the effort too much because you're making a mess of the pace. So if you need to wheel, if you're only using a road and you don't have access to a track, buy a wheel, wheel 400 meters or every 200 meters so that you can keep an eye. Always use the same place for consistency with results. And so you run a mile, basically easy. And then you pick it up, maybe 20, 30 seconds per mile. You run that. And then you pick it up 20, 30 seconds a mile, you run that, and you basically go to the point where the last mile is, is, is pretty tough. It's not all out, but it's pretty tough. It's not easy. And each time you record your rate of perceived exertion, for today, we can call rate of perceived exertion, just use out a 10, a scale of one to 10, how hard was it? Hopefully the final one is like eight and a half, nine. It doesn't have to be 10, it doesn't have to be like a knackered, but it might be pretty hard. If you get your scale wrong and you're already at a nine after like the third rep, that's okay. Just, that's okay. Next time start a little bit easier and instead of jumping 30 seconds, maybe jump 15 seconds per mile. And so you do your test, you, you check your average heart rate for each mile rep and you check your maximum heart rate for each mile rep and you write down your rate of perceived exertion out of 10. And then every four or five weeks, this is a test that you can come back to to see if things have improved. Prior to doing a race, this could be your little test, maybe 10 days before that you do it, you write down the results, you go race, and then depending on how the race goes, you, you write that next to the test. And then in future, you have these like, checkpoints, these tests that you can do that have a, a relevance because you, you raced. And you're like, okay, well, when I done that test, my, you know, at seven minute mile pace, my average, my, my average heart rate was 150, my max was 154. And, you know, I went on in two weeks time to run a 10K PB. Now it's a bit lower. My rate of perceived exertion's a bit lower. It's six out of 10 instead of seven or eight out of 10. It's looking likely that I might be able to run a PB in that 10K. That's a really cool thing to start doing. 
And the other thing that I would say, and this is what I'm going to do, is I'm going to start to have this kind of test that isn't like 2Ks, because 2Ks are great, or mile reps are great, but I'm going to have like a, I'm basically going to have, I know that, I just told you, 168 average heart rate is roughly a marathon, and so I'm going to start doing maybe like a 30 to 40 minute, I'm going to find a loop, there's one here in Flagstaff that I have in mind, but it's just got too much snow at the minute, and I'm going to start doing, it's a 7 mile loop, and I'm just going to start doing that 7 mile loop, so I'll do my 2Ks on the track and I'll have that test, but then I'm also going to just start doing that 7 mile loop and I'm going to say to myself, okay, the heart rate's not allowed to go above 165 and this loop has hills, it has downhills, it, it could be, you know, tough going, the, the ground isn't always perfect and I see it as like, a, okay, that test on the track is looking good, the mile reps are looking good or the 2Ks are looking good, but now we're going to almost take it to the field. This is like a field test. It's a tough loop, it's pretty challenging, and then you get to sort of cross compare, okay, now that my, you know, my track stuff's looking good, now that my little test, whether it's on the road or whether it's on the track, my miles, my tukis, now that that's looking better, I wonder will that convert to like a six or seven mile effort in one go, where you've got rules, the heart rate's not allowed to go over, roughly where your maybe threshold heart rate is, that one hour pace, and you then go and see how do you do that day. And then what holds you back? Or, like did your heart rate start to rise? Did you have to slow down so that it couldn't keep going up? When did that happen? And it just means that in future, if you do those mile reps, and let's say the results haven't improved that much or at all, but then you go do your six or seven mile test and you find that yes, the speed hadn't improved and the heart rate hadn't really came down, but you find when you did the six or seven mile effort that you were just able to sustain the speed way better than the previous time that you'd done it, well, something has still improved. You've improved how long you can keep the heart rate at that fancy nice level at that certain pace. And guys, that's about it today for heart rate. Um, the next session that I'll do on heart rate, I'm gonna go through determining zones, what some of those mean, maybe I like how to structure some training with heart rate but I hope you enjoyed today check out some of the other videos there is heaps of stuff already on heart rate in the running master class at joggingroom.com you can check that out I guarantee you that if you enjoyed today you will enjoy the master class and I've also offered anybody within seven days a free refund if it's not what they thought or they don't think it would help I hope you enjoyed this, give me some love, subscribe to the channel, like, comment below if you have any topics that you'd like covered or any further stuff or heart rate in the next few sessions and yeah, have a great week of training and take care.